my name is Les Crawford. I'm one of the elders here. I also work full-time at the Adelaide College of Ministries. And uh, we're continuing our Tough Question series. And uh, the topic this morning is, does God discriminate against women? Uh, I kind of felt like I drew the short straw on this one. Because uh, it is a tough question. And uh, it's pretty important because... For most churches, at least half the congregation are women, or at least female. And so you really have to do this well, otherwise you may not escape the building unharmed. And uh, as Jeff said, we've called the police and hopefully we'll have some security at the end of the message. But uh, I hope it isn't necessary, actually. That's particularly important. Uh, but this morning I thought that to start us, it might be wise to consider our cultural context uh, by considering how the society in which we live views this whole topic of uh, equality for women, discrimination against women, and so on. Uh, and the best source for that is to go to the Australian Human Rights Commission, uh, which uses the UN, the UN Convention to establish its policies. And the first article in the convention reads this way. Uh, for the purposes of the present convention, the term discrimination against women shall mean any distinction, exclusion, or restriction made on the basis of sex or gender, which has the effect or purpose of impairing or nullifying the recognition, enjoyment, or exercise by women, irrespective of their marital status, on the basis of equality of men and women, of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the political, economic, social, cultural, civil, or any other field. Man, that's a mouthful, isn't it? It's a pretty long sort of statement. But I think the gist of this whole convention and the gist of the whole move towards equality and dealing with discrimination, in other words, trying to remove discrimination against women, has the idea that it's good for women that this happens. In other words, this will make women uh, more fulfilled and satisfied and, and joyful in their day-to-day -day lives. I think that's the intention that's behind this idea of getting rid of discrimination against women. Uh, I use the word flourishing as I try to think about what God's intention is for humanity, including women and men. Uh, so you'll hear that term a few times as I'm speaking this morning. Now in Australia, the discrimination legislation actually includes exemptions for religious organisations. Uh, and the reason for that is that Religious organisations have certain convictions, uh, have a conscience about certain things uh, that actually do mean that there are some distinctions between the sexes, that there are sometimes exclusions or restrictions on the basis of gender. And so that means that churches, such as our own, have freedom to make those gender distinctions as their function as a, spir a spiritual community. Uh, because they want to apply what they believe the Word of God teaches. Uh, and it's a result of that, I think, that people sort of equate church practice or church belief with God. And so if they see the church has made uh, some more restriction or uh, has narrowed the opportunities of women within the life of the church, then they think that God is like that and that he's discriminatory and they use that term. And so some churches do exclude women from uh, the highest, I guess, leadership within the church. Uh, they restrict women in respect to ministry uh, on the basis of their gender. Uh, and actually, we're a church like that, just in case you didn't know. Uh, we don't have elders who are women. Uh, we don't have pastors who care for our adult congregation as women. Uh, women don't preach and teach to the general congregation. They don't do what I'm doing right now. You haven't seen a woman actually preaching the word of God here in our church. So, and that, by the way, is regardless of how spiritually gifted they are or how spiritually mature they are or how talented they are, we have lots of incredibly gifted, talented, mature women in our church. One of them just stood up here and read the scriptures. Another one's sitting in the pew. It's my wife. That's it. I had to get that one in, didn't I, Jeff? I said in the earlier service that I'd mentioned my wife, and I did. So expect some benefits for that. Yeah. 
So we're not saying that we don't have talented women. We're not saying we don't have gifted women. We're not saying we don't have mature women. We're not saying we don't have women who have incredible contributions to the life of our church. But what we're saying as a congregation is that we believe that God has defined some things about our church with respect to women's role. So is that discrimination? You know, is God's order and his commands discriminatory? Are they actually against women? Well, this morning I hope to show you that that's not the case. I hope to show you that God has created and commanded gender distinctions between men and women. And he's done it for the good of men and women. He's done it for human flourishing, for our spiritual, our social, our emotional, and all the other aspects of our well-being. And if you want to interpret that as discrimination, well, that's up to you. You can use whatever label you like. I personally don't think that that's the right label. Now, I need to tell you up front a couple of things that sort of govern what I'm going to say. Number one is that I regard the scripture as the ultimate authority. Uh, it's not a question of human opinion. It's not a question of social consensus. It's not an opinion of what the majority thinks out there. We take a survey of what the average Aussie thinks. It's a question of what God says through his word. That's the ultimate authority that I work with. The second thing that you need to know is that I'm convinced that God's design or order for human function has been created for human flourishing. In other words, whatever he has instructed us about is for our good. It's not for our harm, it's not for our misery, it's actually for our joy. And the reason I say that is if you read chapter 1 of Genesis, which gives us the whole description of the creation week, uh, the six days in which God made everything, uh, when the sixth day is concluded, which then concludes with the creation of Adam and Eve, the first human beings, God has a verdict on his creation. Throughout he said, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then in the end he says, it is very good. And so as he looks down on all he has made and all that has been involved in all he has made, and particularly as he looks at men and women, or in the case of <clears throat> the first parents, Adam and Eve, he sees it as very good, which really means that Everything is as it should be. It's going to work beautifully. It's going to be functionally perfect. That every individual, every creature, uh, every living thing that's a part of this earth and the universe in which God has placed us is going to actually be completely happy, fully fulfilled, and satisfied in every respect. It's going to be as it was meant to be. That's God's heart. That's God's intention. Now, the last thing you need to know is that I can only scratch the surface of this topic. Uh, if you're willing to give me three or four hours of your time, I probably can cover most of it well. I don't think you're going to give me that time. I think when 12 comes around, most of you are going to be wanting to leave. Uh, so I'm going to have to choose selectively certain things to cover this morning. Uh, what I'm not going to be able to cover is all the practical outworking of what I'm going to talk about this morning. I'm really going to deal with it at a principal level. And so I'm going to cover three things. I'm going to cover God's original design, which I believe assigns distinct roles to men and women. I'm going to cover briefly the continuing design in the New Testament. And then I want to cover God's heart or God's attitude for women and for obviously men and humanity generally. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to open your word. Thank you for this topic which is sensitive, uh, it's challenging, uh, it's genuinely a tough question, uh, but you have given us answers and you do reveal to us clearly what you want for us as human beings in your word. Help me to be clear, help me to be sensitive, uh, help the congregation to have hearts that are welcoming your truth. And we ask that you do this for the sake of your son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. So I think that God's, well, I don't think it. I believe that God's original design assigns distinct roles to men and women. And I think we can find this in the original creation of both Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2. It's very clear that in terms of the order of creation, Adam was created first. Then Eve is created after him. It's also clear that Adam's method of creation is different to Eve's. Adam is formed from the dust of the ground. Uh, a human body is formed out of those composite elements, and then God energizes or makes alive that body, and we have Adam. Uh, 
But Eve is taken, oh, well, sorry, Eve is created from a rib taken from Adam's side. Uh, so that she, in a sense, is derived from Adam. And Adam actually recognizes that reality because he says when the woman is brought to him, and this must have been a pretty significant event for him to see this woman who is actually made for him, and he sees this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Uh, just as an aside, you have to realize that in our English language, we're using words that actually come from the first chapter of, sorry, the second chapter of Genesis. Our culture uses the words man and woman, and guess where they come from? The Bible. Now, these are English rendering of Hebrew words, but nevertheless, you know, God has the one who set everything up. He's the one who established this original order in the Garden of Eden. Now, why do I say that their method of creation is different and that's significant? Well, because... Eve is actually derived from Adam, which means that she, in a sense, is dependent on Adam. But she's also of the same substance as Adam. She is equally human to Adam, so therefore she's equal with Adam. And so there's nothing about equality in being that suggests you have to have equal functions in every respect. You can be equal in being but have very distinct functions or distinct roles. And we'll see that unfold more in this story uh, by the way, if we turn to the New Testament, and we will a little bit later in this message, uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, when Paul is arguing for an order in humanity, he actually argues from God to Christ to man to woman. And he recognizes that there is distinctions in the Godhead in roles. The Father has a different role to the Son, and yet they're both equal, equally God. And you couldn't get any more equal than that particular trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we've seen one of the roles of the Son this morning in giving his life in our place. The Father didn't die on the cross. The Son died on the cross. But the Father sent the Son for that purpose. So there's, there's distinctions in the Godhead which has got nothing to do with equality. It's got something to do with harmonious function in that beautiful trinity of oneness. So, before Eve ever arrives on the scene, Adam is given responsibility. He is actually to manage the garden. And not only is he to manage the garden, but he's given an opportunity to name the animals that God has already made. Uh, he names the, the living creatures. Uh, and by the way, naming is an authoritative role. Uh, Adam is given a leadership role here to assign to these amazing creatures, which he's seeing for the first time, basically, a designation of their identity, and he names them. And it's very clear that the names stick, because whatever he named them, they, they were named. That was it. Uh, if you read a little bit later in the story, of course, we've read that Adam says that she shall be called woman. And then later in the story, it will tell us that he named her Eve, the mother of all living. Adam, again, exercised a leadership role in giving a name to this woman twice. This, again, is part of his function, his role within humanity. Uh, the other interesting thing that happens here, of course, is that when Adam sees these pairs coming to him, he can notice that there's male, female, male, female, male, female, male. No female yet. Male, female, male, female. It must have happened quite a long time period of time, several hours, I'm sure it would have taken him to go through this process, then he's ready for God to provide Eve. And God has already known this. I mean, he's seen that it's not good that man should be what? Alone. That he would make a helper fit for him. And so Eve is made for Adam as a helper fit for him. Now, a helper role is different from the leader role. But they do this together in complete harmony, in complete mutuality for both, of those, uh, for both of them having a flourishing, fulfilled, prosperous, joyful, happy future together. Another interesting thing occurs, of course, in this situation. And once this whole arrangement is put in place... The blessing that was intended gets messed up. 
And it gets messed up because sin enters into the situation to corrupt this arrangement, to corrupt the people in it, and to corrupt the entire human race. And it's an interesting approach that happens with sin and its entrance. The serpent, being used by Satan, tempts Eve to eat of the fruit that Adam had been told they shouldn't eat of. She eats. Now, Adam is nearby, and so she hands the fruit to Adam and says, You eat. And the text tells us in Genesis 3 that he takes and eats. Eve takes the lead. Adam fails to lead. And disaster strikes. Now, one of the most staggering things about that text to me is the nearness of Adam to the situation, and he doesn't do anything. He's passive. It's not what men are meant to be. They're meant to be passive. Now, you might think, well, is there anything else in this story that might indicate that Adam has a, a leadership role, a, a headship role, an authoritative role in the situation? Uh, well, guys, I hate to tell you that there is, and it's not something that we necessarily appreciate. The fact is that when sin is being held accountable for, guess who has the buck stop with him? Well, it's a him, so it must be Adam, right? Adam is the one in whom sin is accounted. The Bible is very clear about the fact that in Adam, sin enters the world, as in Christ, so salvation enters the world. Adam is the head of this human race. But who's first? Eve. She sinned first. Hang on. Doesn't seem right to me. I thought the woman should be held accountable for it. In fact, Adam thought so too, because Adam tried to shift the blame from himself to the woman. He actually says to God, you know, the woman that you gave me, she... And guess what God said? That's not going to cut it. You are responsible. You are the one who is going to, in a sense, carry this as a whole race. See, God is holding Adam responsible for his leadership. He's holding Adam responsible for his role. And he did not do well. And so I think Genesis, and I'm doing this very briefly, (laughs) Genesis actually indicates that from the very beginning, before sin ever entered the world, in the original creation order, there was a distinct role for man and a distinct role for woman. And they were meant to be together, working together, so that they could be, as it says, one flesh. In other words, doing this in unity. But sin disrupts that, and things get ugly from there on. So if that's the original design, what happens in the New Testament? Does the New Testament continue this design? Does the New Testament have the same flavor or the same emphasis in terms of the roles of men and women? Because some in the church do argue that because of the gospel and because of Christ, all gender distinctions have been removed. Now They'll quote from Galatians saying, you know, in Christ there's neither male nor female, there's neither slave nor free. There's neither slave, uh, sorry, uh, Greek or Hebrew. Uh, all those gender distinctions have gone. Pew! Well, remember I said before that human beings at the level of our existence, the level of our being, are entirely equal. We're all equally human. We're all equally valuable to God. We all, as male or female, have a standing before God if we're in Christ. It's exactly the same. You know, men aren't any higher or women aren't any higher or lower or whatever than each other. But that's not what the Bible is describing when it's talking about roles. Because those role differences do continue in specific ways. I mentioned 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, there's an issue of uh, women's function in worship. And when Paul is arguing for the right relationship between men and women in worship, he refers to the order in the Godhead, then to the order between men and women. And he says basically the order is this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 to 6. God, then Christ, then man, then woman. And again, this is not a distinction in equality as far as My status before God or the essential nature of my humanity, it's got everything to do with a different role. You see, Christ was actually under God in the role that he performed as a servant suffering on our behalf. So there's this role relationship that we have to understand exists in the New Testament and we can't ignore it. And the argument behind that is exactly the same as the argument 
going back in Genesis. Man is created first and the woman after the man. This is the order and the purpose of God's creation. Now, the key passage, and I'm sure this is the one that causes the most challenge for people who disagree with this, is in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 to 15. So if you turn your Bibles there, you might find it's worth looking at what the text says. And if you're using a pew Bible, uh, then this is on page 991, I believe. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting at verse 9. Having talked about prayer, that men should pray, that's a challenge in itself, says, Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man, Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. And that's one of the most difficult verses in the New Testament, so we're not going to go there. The point of the passage is found in verses 12 and 13. Paul is sometimes regarded by commentators who don't accept the plain teaching of this passage as being a bit of a woman hater. Uh, some also suggest that this is a cultural norm, that in Ephesus, where Timothy was a pastor, that there were particular women that were causing major problems and therefore they had to be dealt with in a particular way. But if you read the text, it says quite clearly, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, and then it gives you two reasons. It says, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So on the basis of the creation order and the nature of the fall, this restriction is placed upon women. Women teaching and having authority over men. It's not a culturally defined thing. Before culture ever existed, these principles were established. The creation order and the nature of the fall. Both of them very clearly taught in the Old Testament. See, the continuity is here. The New Testament is building on what the Old Testament has already revealed. If you didn't have Genesis 1 and 2, you really couldn't understand these New Testament passages. They wouldn't make any sense at all. And so I think that the New Testament does teach that... There is a restriction, there is a limitation on the role of women in the church. We're not going to go to any other places, there are other things we could talk about. A little later in this passage, uh, oh, sorry, in this letter of First Timothy, we read in chapter 3 the qualifications for overseers or elders. And it's pretty plain that they are men. And the reason I say that is because they have to be the husband of one woman. And that's not an easy task for a woman to achieve. Uh, not all men achieve that task either. I'm pleased to have one woman as my wife, my first wife and only wife. But it's clear that the text is limiting the role of elder to men and not opening it up for men and women. So if God has charged men... And by the way, men, you should be listening to this because it's a charge, it's a responsibility. If God has charged men and not women with the responsibility of spiritual authority, and that will be also in the family as well as the church, uh, in the church it's the protection and propagation of doctrine especially, and exercising spiritual oversight over this spiritual community, uh, God has done that. Is that discrimination against women? I mean, I think if you're a woman... You might think that it is, because I can't hide the fact that this is based on gender. It's not based on talent. It's not based on gift. It's not based on spiritual maturity. I mentioned that earlier. We have women in our church who are extremely spiritually mature, very talented, very gifted, wonderful contributors to the life of our church. But the Bible says you can't be an elder. 
The Bible says you can't be a public preacher like I am to the adult congregation as an authoritative voice from God, from his word. It sounds discriminatory, doesn't it? it? sounds like God is keeping you out of something that you could have. That's what it sounds like. It's hard for our society, especially who don't necessarily accept the authority of the word of God, to see that as anything but discrimination. But I have one more thing I want to tell you about. As I mentioned at the very beginning, I have an assumption is that God's intentions for humanity are good. That God wants us to flourish as human beings. He wants the very best for us as human beings. Even after the fall. Even after we messed up. Even after we live now in a fallen world as fallen people. You see, God's original design was for human flourishing. The arrangement was intended to maximize our joy, not minimize it, not make us miserable. And you know, if God is the one who made men and women, then surely God is the one who knows how they will function best. Now, I do think, again, the intention of even our legislative movements and intention of some of our societal pressures are to try to bring good for everybody. I mean, that's what they're thinking. But then they're really saying that we're experts on human flourishing. We're experts on what is best for humanity. And I challenge that because I think only the creator is the expert on the creation. So that being the case, and discrimination being generally a very negative word, uh, how can I sort of demonstrate to you that God actually has a very positive heart towards women, that he's not negative towards women? Well, I think the best way of doing that is to go to the life of Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the answer for everything in Sunday school, I know, but sometimes in preaching, he's also a very good place to go in trying to bring out the attitude and the heart of God because Jesus is the most dramatic and powerful revelation of God that we have. You can't get any better than the person of Jesus. Hebrews tells us that all the way through the whole book. So what was Jesus' perspective on women? And by the way, in the cultural context of the first century, women weren't highly regarded. Sorry to say it for you. Uh, Women didn't have a high place of recognition. They didn't have a very uh, authoritative role in the society, even though women are always influential, don't get me wrong. (laughs) Women know how to be influential, even if they don't have official recognition. But there are certain elements of the first century culture. When you look at Jesus, you go, he is not functioning in the culture. He's just not living out the cultural norms. Listen to how Jesus relates to women. First of all, Jesus was a rabbi. In other words, he was a teacher. He had disciples. And in his discipleship group, his followers included women. In Luke chapter 8, you'll read about the women that actually were a part of this community. In fact, they were a positive part of the community because they helped support the community. Uh, They were a very active part of this community. Jesus ministered to women in many situations. He ministered to them in healing. He actually cast out demons on behalf of a mother for her daughter. He raised a widow's son to life to provide for the widow. And he forgave the sins of women, just like he had forgiven the sins of men. Very interestingly, he honors a widow when she gives an offering at the temple. Just a little offering, but it was all she had in comparison to all the other offerings that were given, which were primarily by men, and the contrast is with a man. He honors this widow for her sacrifice. He seeks out an ostracized woman, a woman who in the culture was shamed, culture who was excluded. He seeks her out at a well to minister to her spiritual need, the woman at the well in John chapter 4. A woman is brought to Jesus who's been caught in adultery and it's actually a trap for Jesus and he protects this woman. He doesn't condone her actions but he neither condemns her actions either and frees her, setting her on a path of life. Two women lose their brother. He dies and Jesus weeps with those women. Lazarus, he weeps with their weep, they're weeping over his death. 
There's a woman who, showing her love for Jesus, actually pours out a very expensive ointment called nard, pure nard. And she's criticized, but Jesus does what? Jesus actually elevates that woman. In fact, he says that that woman's act of love will be forever remembered and told. And it is, because it's in the gospel stories. Jesus also thinks of his own mother, the most precious woman to him, when he's in the agony of crucifixion. In John chapter 19, Jesus makes sure that his mother is taken care of because not only is his death not final, his presence on earth is, however, and she will need someone to care for her. And in the middle of his suffering, he looks at that situation and provides for her need. Perhaps more remarkable than many of these stories is the story of the first witnesses to the resurrection. The first witnesses to the resurrection are women. But you know, in the first century, a woman's witness did not count for anything anywhere. And yet Jesus gives these women the privilege of being the first people to actually know that he has risen from the dead. Very countercultural. Very countercultural. Jesus highly valued women. He demonstrated a deep concern for their well being, whether it be physical or spiritual, whether it be emotional or social. Jesus was concerned for the women around him. So, what I'm suggesting to you this morning is that you can trust Jesus and equally trust God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the whole Trinity to know what is best for women and men. Because their heart attitude towards us is not one to rob us of anything, to take away from us of anything, but to give us more than we deserve, far more than we deserve. God's design for humanity expressed in gender distinctions between men and women and the accompanying differences that that applies to roles, it's not discriminatory, it's actually complementary. It's designed to work together for all to get the best out of life possible. And I can testify to that in marriage. I can testify to that in ministry, that when men and women work together within the defined ways in which God has made them and the roles that he's assigned them, it's a beautiful thing. It's an awesome thing. So the challenge really isn't knowing what God's design is. The challenge is actually living it. That's the hard part because it's complicated by sin. It's complicated by our alienation and rebellion against God. You see, I can easily live my life selfishly. In fact, it's a default position for humanity. I can lead abusively. I can do things just for my own well-being and good. Not for others, not for communities, not for a wife or a family and a woman can do exactly the same thing she can have her own selfish agendas she can have her own selfish goals and outcomes when you put those selfishnesses together it's a disaster we all need help to follow God's design the good news is help is available if you're not a Christian here this morning this might be a very strange message to you but I hope you can sense that perhaps there's something to it, not only in the truth of it, but in the need of it, and that you might sense that you have a need for the Lord Jesus to help you to live life well, without selfishness, without self-regard, but for others and God. And then you've got the best help of all immediately available. It's, the person's called the Holy Spirit. You know, when Paul wrote to the Ephesians a bit later than <clears throat> uh, the early passages that we might have thought about, not the one to Timothy, but when he wrote directly to the church, he actually introduced distinctions in role, husbands and wives, fathers and children, or mothers and children, masters and slaves, or employers and employees in the modern era, by a precondition. The condition was that you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need to be energized, controlled, directed by the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, there's no way you're going to be able to be a good father good mother, you know where you're going to be a good husband or a good wife. We need the Holy Spirit to be these things. But the good news is if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. The distinctions between men and women and their role differences are good. It's what God's intended. We just don't use them well. 
And we'll only experience their blessing when we do and we live them out as God has commanded for his glory. And I hope this morning you can see that God does not discriminate against women. Even though the Bible does teach gender distinctions and role differences. And I also hope that you want to live out this design personally, whether you're a woman or a man, that you will submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit in applying the scriptures, because that's what we all need to do. And if we do that well, then we will have the most beautiful community, we'll have the most beautiful marriages, we'll have the most beautiful families.